never deviated my plans, so I listen to him. I don't listen to me so much. I listen to him when it comes to preaching his word. source off and not turn the other one on. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, just one verse of scripture to get us going, and that's found in verse 15. <clears throat> the Bible says this, this thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Philogius and Hermonides. And listen, this, this is something that really kind of stuck out to me. Um, is that, is, is the, that Paul here, who's writing to Timothy, says that out of all the churches of Asia, people have turned away from me. All they which are in Asia be turned away from me. I thought, wow. I mean, here's the guy that started all these churches. Here's the guy that, you know, he's, he's called, called apostle to, uh, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And, and now here these, these churches of Asia had, had turned away from him. And I think that was just a glimmer of what would become later on as we, as we follow time into our current time. Uh, we, we see more evidence of that than, than any place else. And we can't, we can't sit and think that, that if, if something like that can happen to Paul, who is an amazing, amazing preacher... Used, used over and over by God and, and, and an apostle of Jesus Christ to, to go to the Gentiles. If something like that could happen to him, how, easy, how much easier could it happen to us in this day and age? So I want to teach tonight on those who have turned away. Those that have turned away, we see a lot of that Throughout, uh, throughout all churches, throughout all denominations, uh, all of these things, even so-called non-denominationals, uh, all of them across the board have seen a great falling away uh, from the house of God. And this is not something that's new. Now, I'm not giving you anything new. We know that this is the case because it's the last days and we've been told that a great falling away would happen. I just think that many of us thought maybe that Jesus would come and we wouldn't see it, but it's here. So we're gonna we're gonna look and dive into this here <coughs> for a few moments uh, this evening. Heavenly Father, I pray now for your help. I pray you'd help me deliver this, your word. I pray, Father, that you would enlighten us through the Holy Spirit of God, that you would uh, that you would open our minds and our hearts, our understanding that we may really get a glimpse of what's going on, uh, that it would help us to see our own time and our own peoples, our uh, own churches and, and, and assemblies, this, how you see it and how it's presented here and uh, in, in your word. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So Paul here, he's writing to Timothy. He's telling him, of course, in, in, in the previous uh, in previous writings, and uh, to hold fast the sound words that have been given, to keep that good thing that's committed to him. <clears throat> the first chapter of the second of these pastoral epistles seem to be meant to encourage him as a young pastor during these perilous times to remain faithful to the Lord, to the brethren, the local church. So in our verse for today, this is really something that I haven't really noticed uh, in just passing, reading it maybe, or just over maybe by oversight, uh, but I, I really just, 
miss that phrase, all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Uh, evidently, these churches of Asia had already fallen away in the latter years of Apostle Paul. And he had started these churches and they turned away from him. Then he named two who may have been pastors or at least leaders in these churches. And this is the reason for the warning to Timothy not to be swayed by others or fail to follow the old paths uh, that Paul had set down. These churches and men didn't leave the apostle Paul because of anything that he had done. He wasn't teaching false doctrine. See, back in the day, and things have changed so much nowadays. It used to be, and, and, and Pastor Ron can, can back me up on this because he's seen a lot more of this uh, than I have seen. But yeah, I've seen it in my lifetime that it used to be that when people left a church, it was over a doctrinal issue. You either moved away to somewhere else and you wouldn't be able too far to come, or you had a doctrinal problem with what was going on, what was being taught, what was being preached was heresy. In other words, it wasn't biblically sound. It wasn't sound doctrine. Listen, uh, if you're in a church and they're not teaching what's right, you have the authority to get up and walk away. You do. You do not have to be stuck going somewhere that doesn't teach or preach the truth of the word of God. That is the authority of the word of God, and God wants you to hold fast the sound of form words, right? The form of sound words, that that is sound doctrine. Do not be swayed by doctrines of devils and people that bring in half-truths and they mix it with lies and then they try to get you drawn off and into a different way. There's way too many people that are in that business on TV and radio today. Right. It's very crucial for a child of God to have in their ears, in their mind and in their hearts, that which comes directly from the word of God itself in sound biblical doctrine. That is why God tells us to study to show ourselves approved. That we might be able to, number one, not be ashamed. But also rightly divide the word of truth. That God wants you to have that ability. And that's why you study. Because you know what? If you don't study to show yourself approved, how will you ever know who's feeding you the wrong stuff? You're not going to know. You're not going to know it's true. Just because they get up and call it a Bible, and they say this and they say that. And also, be careful about preachers that also want to take the Greek or Hebrew and make the Bible say something it doesn't say. Listen, you don't need the Greek or the Hebrew in order to have understanding of the Word of God. We have absolute perfect, and I mean perfection, in the translation from those languages into English this is what God says. It's what he means. You don't need anybody coming in here and saying, well, this can be interpreted this way, or it can be interpreted this way. What is that? That's confusion. Okay? God preserved his word in English for you. There's a reason for that. Because he wants you to have something consistent that you could build your life on. He wants you to have something consistent to build your spirit on. He wants you to have something consistent to build your family on. Why? Because it's something that will build, the, it's what you build the church on. And if you don't build the church on the right things, the church will never stand. That's one great thing about what's went on in this place over the last, what, 40 some years? is that God's word has gone forth as God's word from the pulpit, from this platform, by a man of God. 
That is the difference maker. That's a difference maker. You can't ever, ever go away from that. And so that's what Paul's trying to encourage Timothy with, is I don't care what these people are doing. I don't care what these people are doing. I need you to follow what I've written. I need you to follow what I've set before you. These things that I've commended unto you for your keeping, you need to keep them and do them and not waver from them. Don't get sidetracked because this one turns away and that one turns away and these turn away and those turn away. Don't do that. And that's one thing that you could credit Temple Baptist Church with. Out of everybody that's walked out of those doors, the message hasn't changed. We've never switched Bibles. We've never switched doctrines. We've not eased up on doctrines. We've given the full counsel of God. Amen. Has it always been easy to hear and endure? No, but we needed it. That's one thing that you could say that we've done absolutely right through this whole thing. Through all the years that it's been open, it's been faithfully proclaimed as the word of God. The doctrines are what they are. And Jesus tells us what they are. The Holy Spirit helps us to know what they are. So we experience the same falling away today as Paul spoke of two millenniums ago. It's not a new thing. Jesus rebuked the Jews for stoning the prophets who spoke the word of God. Israel rejected the forerunner, John the Baptist, who prepared them for the coming of the long-awaited Lamb of God. Israel rejected the Messiah, Christ himself, God in the flesh, and his teachings. Israel rejected the apostles, with almost all of them dying a martyr's death. The Gentiles rejected, in this verse, one of the greatest preachers, in the Bible, I mean, Paul was an amazing preacher. Think about that, how he was given revelations directly from God, given them things that they never heard before, which makes sense why they wanted to kill him. It seemed like heresy. They'd never heard that before. They had the law, they had... Moses, they had all of that. They had the veil over themselves, over their hearts. They weren't ready to hear any of that. So thus, 2,000 years later, we should not be dismayed or shocked at the denominations and churches and individuals who reject the fundamental truths of this blessed book. Don't be, don't be swayed because somebody else is. Look, just because somebody else is shook doesn't mean you have to be. You realize that? You have your own strength to stand on in Christ alone. And so, <clears throat> though Paul gave no explanation here as to why the churches and men turned away from him and the truth of God's word, I want to use several examples in the Bible to show what possibly happened to the churches in Asia along with their spiritual leadership. First thing I think of is church members are leaving good, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist churches for worldly, doctrinally incorrect ones. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not crying about it. I'm not complaining about it. Uh, I'm just explaining the falling away of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the light of intimate return of the Lord, it's in full swing. They're not leaving because of false doctrine or, 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 or you, know, dic, you know, pastors that think they're dictators. They're leaving, the, the, for the most part, is their own internal issue, is their own internal problem. That's generally what drives them away. People, like I said... You know what? When men love darkness rather than light, what do they do? They get away from the light. They don't want to come to the light. They don't want to see that. 
Now listen, if God moves you, that's another story. If God's telling you to go, that's another story. Otherwise, we ought to be here. We ought to be here because we can be. While we still can be. Do you understand? The days may soon come when that could go away. It, it, it's a very, a very possible thing. And I want John chapter 6, uh, uh, at verse 66 and 67, <coughs> it says, from that, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him than Jesus. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? So therefore the question must be asked today, what would cause you to go away? And I thought about this. I thought about listening to teachers that are contrary to what the Bible says. Number one reason you would even think about leaving a Bible-believing church is that you're wrapped up in somebody not teaching the Bible. And they're delivering you false doctrine and you're swallowing it. And the more you hear that stuff, the more you come to believe it. We have had people, once again, Pastor Ron can verify uh, with this, we have had very close people to us that once were firm on the King James Bible being the only Bible that, that, that's right, now have a different position that you could use any Bible. It would sit there and argue with you and try to defend these other versions, or so-called versions. They're perversions is what they are. That's all they are. They'll never do anything good for you. Listen, I, I really wish people would get more upset at people trying to make different kind of Bibles because they're insulting your intelligence. You're too dumb to know what thee and thou means. Why haven't they changed Shakespeare? There's a lot of that in there. Well, certainly that's an archaic text. Why haven't they changed it? Why haven't they modernized it? That this is really uh, Shakespeare for dummies. Right? Shakespeare for dummies. You know, they have, they have those books out that, that are computers for dummies and this for dummies and that for dummies. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's just to play on there because they are downplaying the very intelligence you possess by saying you can't know a word. You know what I do when I don't know a word? I look it up. Isn't that deep? Well, you mean, preacher, you don't, you, you don't just feel like an idiot because you don't know the word? No. I say, I don't know that word. What does that mean? And I look it up. Wow. No, just get the definition. Just defining. Everybody wants to define themselves. They're too lazy to look up a word? You want to try to come up with all these weird names for all these weird so-called genders and you can't look up a word? Come on. They're downplaying the very intelligence that you have. Anybody ought to be just wroth that, that they would even suggest it. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, and a certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Well, that's heresy. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, ooh, their Baptist blood started boiling. Look at that. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this questions. 
So the airways, I want you to understand, are full of apostate teachers. These men, and unfortunately women, are doctrinally incorrect in many areas of the Bible. The, the, the Word of God itself, spiritual gifts, tongues, healings, uh, the local church, eschatology, people like John Hagee and uh, Joyce Myers, Joel Olstein, Benny Hinn, and a whole bunch of other ones. They've got a mixture of truth and error. Listen, you're lucky to be in a Baptist church where you could come and you could hear the doctrines of the Word of God. I want you to get your doctrine from the pastor and from the Word of God, not from what you hear on TV and radio or YouTube shorts, whichever one you like. I don't know when YouTube started wearing shorts, but oh, you'll get that later. It's all good. If you have doctrinal questions, you need to ask your pastor. That's part of what he is here for. I'm, that's what I'm here for is to help you. And you know, do you know what I want? To do? do you know what I do when I don't know something about the Bible? I look it up. I research it. I find out what the Bible has to say and how many places it has to say it in. And I might actually call somebody else that, that's got a little bit more knowledge than I do. Say, hey, I'll, I'll, in my research, I'm finding this. Is that what you've come to find? Well, you know, this is what it is and that. that that's why you have elders. That's why you have elders. I don't know how many times over the years that my, my, my dad and I have had conversations, whether over the phone uh, or, or at the house, uh, and we'd sit down and open up the Bible and we'd just start talking about it. And he'd throw something up to me. Well, what do you think about that? I read this. Now, what do you, what do you get out of this? What do you think about this? And, and, and honestly, that, then we would just look at it, we would study it, and we'd, and we'd, we'd search it out, and we'd come to the same conclusion. The Bible should lead us to the same conclusion on the matter. It should not give you a different conclusion than it gives me. Or something isn't right. The formula is not right. So we have to study and we have to look it up. We have to continue in the things which we've learned and assured of knowing that we've learned them. Secondly, living carnally instead of walking in holiness. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> 2 Timothy 4.10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed unto Thessalonica, uh, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. So I've not, I've got no problem with enjoying life, but the Bible even admonishes us to eat, drink, and be merry. A merry heart is mentioned several times in the Proverbs, but when worldly pleasure becomes the treasure of our hearts, we're going to drift from God, from his church, and from his people. We can't get caught up in the pleasure of our own selves because that draws us away to our own lust because we're enticed. That's, that sounds a whole lot like uh, leading to sin to me as to what the Bible describes it. That's how temptation, we're not... God doesn't tempt you. We're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. But God has made a way of escape in those temptations that we could get out and that we might be able to bear them and, and go through them unscathed. God's done that for us. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, part of the reason that you're here tonight is this is part of your treasure. You have a heart to be here. What do we just read? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your heart is in this ministry, if your heart is in this church, 
That means it's part of your treasure. That's what, that's what it is. This church is a treasure. The, you people are a treasure. Your jewels inside. Just think of this building as just like the treasure chest and all the good stuff's on the inside. And that's part of who you are. You're part of the treasure of this place. Thirdly, being offended by the preaching of God's word. That's a big one. John 8, 45 and 46. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Offended believers are the res result of a lack of love for God's word. Psalm 119, 165 says that if... You love God's law, nothing, will, nothing with, will offend you. Failure to change when convicted is going to cause a child of God to, hurt, to, to, to turn from the hearing of God's word, which could also lead them away from the church because of the fact they don't want to hear anymore because they don't want to address what's being convicted in their life. That's part of it. And when we don't want to deal with something and we're being stubborn about it, you know what God's going to do every time you show up? He's going to speak to you about that thing. He's going to keep on convicting you about that thing. So how do you get away from the convicting, convicting power of the Holy Spirit while you're, while you're coming to a, a, a Bible-believing and Bible-preaching church? You got to stop coming to a Bible believing, Bible preaching church in order to not hear anything to bring conviction. Do you realize that that is 90, probably, I want to guess upper 90% of probably why most people are in those other churches today? That's a huge one. God has spoken to them from the word of God about something that is wrong. They will not change what is wrong. They are sick and tired of being in an atmosphere that brings conviction. So what do you do? You go where no conviction exists. Because I want you to understand something very clearly. When you go somewhere where this isn't, you will never find conviction. You will never find anything to make you sorry for what's in your life. You will never find anything that will make you feel bad, that will make you feel sinful. That will make you feel shame for what you've done in your life and what you refuse to do for the God who gave his life and blood and everything for you. You'll never find it if you go somewhere that this book isn't present in the pulpit. Know that. Be very, very confident. Of that, I can stand on the authority of God's word. Where this book is, there is conviction because it says that his word is sharp. It's, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. A dividing asunder between the bone, even down into the marrow, even into the intents of the heart. You can't go to a church that has this book if you're trying to escape conviction. You have to go somewhere where there is no conviction. That sums up a great majority, I believe, of what we find in this day and age. So there's becoming offended by the preaching of the word of God. There's fellowshipping with the wrong kind of people. <coughs> Psalm 
Second Thessalonians chapter, <coughs> excuse me, chapter three, verse six and seven. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, <coughs> and after the tradition, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. See, evil communications still corrupt good manners. Hanging around with carnal or disgruntled people will rub off on you. Used to be an old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And that's the truth of it. And usually when you find complainer that decides to leave you'll find a bunch of other complainers that follow them. And that's probably the best for the church, honestly. You don't really want to have all that. Listen, I'd be scared to death to have a bunch of complaining in the house of God. I would. Look what that did for Israel. It got them, it got them serpents, fiery serpents that would kill them. And even after Moses prayed for them at their request, God never took the, the vipers away. He didn't take their teeth. He didn't make their teeth fall out. He didn't even make them non-venomous snakes. But he said, you're going to make a brass pole with a serpent on it. And you're going to lift it up. And it's going to come to pass that whoever is bitten and they look on that, they'll live. That didn't take the sting of the bite away. God just removed some of the death. And you say, well, what do you mean some of the death, preacher? Because you know that there's going to be those that got bit that were too proud to look at the serpent. Isn't that what mankind does? God gives you a simple answer to for salvation and they overlook it. They won't look it out of pride. I won't look at that. God gave me these vipers. God's killing people with these vipers, and I'm not looking. So then when they get bit, they don't look, and they choose to perish over simply looking up to be saved. Men still do this today. God said, you're dying. You've already been bit by that viper. You got that venom that's going to kill you. But if you'll just look up to me. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He says, I, I took that death. I took that suffering, I took that pain, I took that sin, I took the cause, I took it all. All you have to do is just come to me with it. I already paid for it. Your salvation, your life is right here. Just come get it. Just come get your life. Think about that. I think about how awful that would be. Let's say I had some supernatural, well, let's go back in the Bible days because that's when it happened. Let's say God gave me the ability to heal any sickness, even death, like he did some of the apostles. And we got a bunch of people that are sitting in here. And I said, okay, I can take care of this. Just, just come to me and let me help you. And they sit back in their chair and they die. Would that be dumb? Would that be foolish? Your help is right here. All you have to do is come here. Let, let me put my hand on you and, and you'll, be, you'll be good. That even the shadow of Peter would, 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 would heal somebody. Think about that. That even... Peter walking by somebody and having their shadow pass over them and have them be healed. 
Think about it. How ridiculous would that be to sit back when I could take care of that for you? Even watching some other people come up and get healed, still sit back there and die. That's what people do with Jesus. They'll watch other people get saved. They'll watch them get baptized. They'll watch their life. They'll see remarkable change. They'll see blessings falling. They'll see God pouring it out for them. They'll notice a difference in that person. But they won't come themselves. They're going to sit back and watch and die. It's pointless. It's ridiculous. And it's needless. No need to do that. But that's what happens. When you, when you choose to fellowship with those that are not walking right, where do you think your fellowship is going to go? Where's that fellowship taking you? Because if they're not walking with God, that means they're walking away from him. And if you're walking with them, you're not walking with him. Don't change, don't change who you're walking with. Don't change who you're walking with. You stick with God and let them go their way. Their way leads to death. Their way leads to destruction. You stick with Jesus. Continue to walk with him. Lastly, becoming ashamed of the testimony of our Lord when persecution arises Mark 14, verse 44 through 46, and then down in verse uh, uh, 50 as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. In verse 45, as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master. And kissed him. Verse 46, and they laid their hands on him and took him. And then if you skip to verse 50, it says, and they all forsook him and fled. They all forsook him and fled. We should not be ashamed of our Lord. Not be ashamed to be Christians. Granted, there are times we need to be ashamed of ourselves, but not ashamed of our Master and our Lord and our Savior. We should never have that be the case at all, ever. And so that is a little insight on those that have turned away. Let me turn this off, and I'm going to go back to the pulpit, Mike.